That, that's my guess. They, they shot out a couple of windows and there was one bullet that I could find in the riser of the stairway going up, one bullet. So I, I don't think the Klan fired 500 rounds at the, at the building. There's no damage to the facade. It is known that two sheriff deputies, Jack Wilkinson and Ed Fergus, had been sent to Heron by the sheriff to be his observers for events of that day. It is also known that they were aware of the assault perpetrated on Smith early in the day, but they did nothing to stop it or attempt to arrest either Hollander Briggs or McKay, who in fact stole the pistol from the constable. It was later brought out during the first day of the coroner's inquest that city policemen, Wright and Stem, had been in a parked car parked next to the Baptist church during the shootout at the Masonic Temple. Though close to the action, they did nothing to stop it or to pursue the perpetrators when the attack stopped. In fact, after the gangster cars left, they drove over to the Smith garage to ask the militia commander if he had anything for them to do. <laughs> Colonel Davis sent them back to the hospital to guard the front door, since the wounded had been, had been carried across the street to the building, and there was concern that they might be finished off in the hospital. Colonel Davis also sent a detail to the Methodist Church Parsonage. The residents of two Klansmen, Reverend J. E. Story and Reverend R. G. Gottsfelty, since their names were reputed to be on the hit list. Other citizens whose names were supposed to be on this were Gene Vincent, who was the son-in-law of John Smith, and has actually had run into the garage earlier that day with his father-in-law, Clyde Fowler, who was the son of H.O. Fowler, whose home and business had been blown up in March 1925. I told you 25 was a little dicey. <laughs> One of the gangster cars with the two dead men in it remained back at the temple. The dead were removed to the hospital and were later taken to an undertaker. The car sat there for an hour. Then somebody moved it. I don't know who. <laughs> they just came and got the car and drove off with it and it disappears from the story, although somebody once said that that was a car that belonged to Charlie and he sent one of his boys back to get it. The wounding of two Klan leaders and the killing of three more were enough to drive the Klan from the field of mortal combat in Williamson County. Never again would the Klan launch any kind of armed raid against the Wet's interests. The Klan would <laughs> remain politically potent for at least two more election cycles, but the vigilante days were over. Smith packed up and moved to Florida after selling his shattered place of business. Every window had been shot out. The doors were just hanging as the jams had all been shot up. Smith did stay in town until Friday in order to be present at the inquest. And there he was once again threatened with a gun in the hands of Blackie Arms. Blackie was arrested by the militia, but immediately set free when he produced his deputy's badge. <laughs> if what happened on election day in Heron, April 13, 1926, was a riot, then the landing on Omaha Beach in Normandy on June 6, 1944 was a riot. It is my contention, it is my belief, that all of this gunplay was a military operation perpetrated by the liquor interests with the consent of the civil authorities at both the city and county levels. The objective was to stop the Klan from getting back up to speed and to continue to make Williamson County a battleground. If that was the objective, it was achieved hands down. The Klan was now 
out of the picture as a player in the criminal activities of the county. <coughs> Unfortunately, this was not the end of armed violence in Williamson County. For the next eight months, the county had to endure a vicious gang war as the criminal organizations represented by the Sheltons and the Burgers fought it out for control of the territory where they could sell the goods and services in so much demand by the young miners and others who enjoyed the booze, the drugs, and the vice in Southern Illinois. I do hope you see that what happened on April 13, 1926 in Heron was in many respects unique in the annals of American lawlessness. Seldom do we see such bloody cooperation between the forces of law and order and the criminal enterprises as they work to cl closely and decisively together to rid themselves of a pesky opponent that made life miserable for both of them. In summary, the bad guys got rid of the bad good guys <laughs> and the simplified, that simplified the struggle for future law and order. Now the field was cleared for the good good guys to battle for the safety and welfare of the people of Williamson County against the real bad guys. Now I will answer any questions as long as, long as they're not the numbers for the lotto. I don't. don't yeah. yes, sir. Uh, I'm from here and I'm really interested in this. I've read it about 15 years. I heard you mention drugs twice. I never heard in my whole lifetime that, of course, alcohol, whiskey, and all that was in there, but I never heard of drugs mentioned. What kind of drugs did they have in them days? Heroin. Heroin? Really? I've never heard of that. Yeah. Morphine, too. Isn't and it? morphine, yeah. Mm -hmm. like today is. Uh, they, Crack was mainly f found in, in New York. It was a, a, a urban kind of uh, drug. But uh, morphine, probably even more than heroin, would be found in, in southern Illinois. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, sir. Did you say again the place where the Smith Garage was? Okay. Was it, it, yes, the corner of 16th yeah, the corner and... Across from the hospital, from the St. Yeah, St. Yeah. Mary's? Yeah. It's, no, it's r right across the street. You know, Directly I, across the street. Okay. I was born in 23, so I know a little bit about that, but I, I didn't know about Smith's garage. Was there another garage later on? Species over on Harrison Street? Did they have some? Well, uh, <coughs> Heron was a rough town, but I don't know anything about <laughs> a Harrison Street garage. It's still there. Yes, sir. And one more question, yes, sir. please. In 26, the Shelton's and the Burger Gang were actually in cahoots at that time. Is that not Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. They okay. fell out. I, as I told these people earlier, yeah. I was going to do the gang wars tonight. Mm -hmm. But I realized I couldn't do the gang wars unless you understood yeah. why it, they were free to have a war yeah. because as long as the Klan was around, they couldn't fight each other. Their hands were full of Klansmen. Yeah. So but once they got rid of the Klan, then they could get at each other. Yeah. So I'm going to do that December 9th. Uh, One more thing. Yes, sir. I enjoyed you very much. Well, thank you. <laughs> I have so much fun doing this, I can't begin to tell you. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm not familiar with the term good bad guys when you're speaking about the Klan? Well, they started out good guys. They really, they really were decent people who wanted to have uh, men go home to their families without being drunk. They wanted to end spousal and child abuse. They wanted them to be sober and kind. And the, the prohibition idea was really good intentions carried to a terrible extreme. It created organized crime. It had so many down effects. It was just wretched, but it was a really good idea. But it's like so many good ideas, you really shouldn't do them. <laughs> well, are you saying the Klan was good guys? At the beginning. But they were anti-Catholic? Well, yes, they were, they were bigoted and they were, they were violent, but they started out wanting law and order. That's what they wanted to have. So they were against prohibitionism? Yeah. They were they were for 